Office of Chairman Richard Prescott, COG Headquarters, Jacinto. Colonel Victor Hoffman arrived five minutes early for the meeting and diverted to the bathroom to tidy his uniform. It wasn't much of a uniform, and this battered building wasn't much of an HQ, but if he started treating anything as not mattering, anything at all, then the rot would set in. This was how civilization was maintained. This was how a society survived. This was how a culture survived. Museums and art galleries could be reduced to rubble, but human society on Syrah could carry on unscathed. But the way a man conducted himself, the basic rules of every moment of every day, that was all that stood between the last humans on Sira and chaotic savagery. It had to be maintained at all costs. So Hoffman checked for stubble on chin and scalp, straightened his collar, and tried to disguise the signs that, yet again, he hadn't had a chance to sleep in 36 hours. What's going to kill me first? This job or the locust? The door opened behind him, just a crack judging by the muffled voice. A woman's voice. He froze, then checked his zipper. The chairman will see you when you're ready, sir. A man couldn't even take a leak in peace these days. Hoffman didn't turn around. He replaced his cap. Thank you. Give me a minute. He counted silently to sixty, contemplating his reflection in a mirror that had also seen better days, and then turned on his heel to walk the few yards down the corridor to Prescott's office. It was a room that hadn't been refurbished since before E-Day. That, at least, won the politician a few points. He was taking the shortages like everyone else. Victor, Prescott said. He stood in front of a makeshift display board, covered in sheets of paper, studying each in turn, then glanced over his shoulder. Take a seat. Are things as hopeful as they look? Hoffman folded his cap and tried not to gaze longingly at a coffee on Prescott's desk. He picked up the briefing notes that were already crisp and ready for him at these pointless monthly meetings and leafed through the digests. Food stockpiles, 10% lower than target. Munitions, a third below target output. Utilities, domestic power supplies, less than 12 hours a day. Business as usual. All I can say, Chairman, is that since the light mass detonation, we've seen mainly locust drones, and in considerably reduced numbers. Normally we'd encounter the full spectrum of locust types over the course of a week. Boomers, nemesis, reavers, you name it. And a lot more drones. Hoffman stopped. That was all he had to say. Prescott stared at him as if he was waiting for him to continue and give him some good news to announce. In the brief silence, an antique clock ticked with a sound like stones falling off a ledge. Prescott's patience held out for six slow seconds. So, did it work? Has the bomb worked? Hoffman didn't like hope these days. It always tended to get crushed. He pinned down his thoughts in the realms of the measurable and predictable as much as he could. It destroyed the locust citadel, he said carefully. It wasn't quite how he'd felt when the light mass bomb ripped the guts out of the locust tunnels, but there was no reason to bullshit Prescott. We're seeing a lot fewer on the surface, and it got rid of most of the krill. But short of strolling down their tunnels and doing a head count, I don't know what the overall effect's been. Time will tell. People need good news to keep going, Victor. And when we get some, sir, you'll be the first to know. Morale is a commodity. For the army, too. Equipment failures went beyond critical a long time ago. 
Hoffman had the same conversation with Prescott every month, like clockwork. We're going to have to think more about diverting more civilian resources to arms manufacture. How am I going to justify that with fewer locust incursions? Shit. I can't win either way, can I? With respect, who do you need to justify it to? The population. They're running on empty, just like you. Without an effective army, they'll be running on dead. I don't want any more riots over rationing and power cuts. Look, Chairman, for the moment my gears aren't as busy as usual. It's a good time to divert some resources into replacing as much equipment as we can. Even if the Locusts have been defeated, you'll still need a strong army during Reconstruction. Once certain groups think the pressure is off, you'll have a whole new bucket of problems on your hands. Top us up now, while we've still got breathing space. It was all true, all solid doctrine. But Hoffman knew how to play politicians. They were short-term thinkers, but flag up a good threat to focus them, and they'd drag their eyes to the more distant horizon. Hoffman actually didn't have the luxury of thinking beyond keeping his men fed and armed for the next day, week, month. So if Prescott got off his back and concentrated on civil unrest and reconstruction, it was one less hassle to deal with. I do understand, Prescott said. I've worn the uniform. For eighteen months, for appearances. Ever been under fire? No. Then you'll know society's deal, sir. Gears put their lives on the line, and civilians make sure they've got enough kit and support to do the job. Anything less is morally unacceptable. And it's also a recipe for defeat. Prescott wandered over to the window and folded his arms, staring out over the city. The grime on the glass. There was no maintenance these days. None of the trappings of a less brutal war gave the broken Jacinto skyline a softer, more flattering focus. He let out a long breath. The average adult male citizen is getting by on 2,300 calories a day, which is about a third of a year's intake. Women on 1,800. Powers off for 12 hours in every 26. Water processing can't keep up. If we didn't tie family food rations to keeping children in school, we'd have feral packs of kids roaming the streets. My job's to keep society running, Victor, any way I can. I have to think past wars. My job is tomorrow. Well, I'm just a war fighter, Hoffman said carefully. My job is making sure there will be a tomorrow. Okay, it's been easy to motivate people against this enemy, Prescott said. It's not the pendulum wars. Locusts aren't remotely human. Nobody's got a grub relative overseas with a different side of the story to tell. They're the enemy of humankind. Real monsters, but hate and tribalism only unite a society so far. We've lasted fourteen years. Hoffman stood up to put on his cap. Long practice made him line the badge up with his nose almost unconsciously, running the edge of the right forefinger down over the metal while his left hand positioned the back of the cap. Sometimes... When he felt the death's head emblem, it made him wonder if the badge was a boast or a prediction. This is a siege. I'm good at sieges. Give me an objective and I'll tell you if I can do it with the kit and men available. I'll see what I can do, said Prescott. Hoffman knew get lost when he heard it. It was all men now, near enough. The Pendulum War days of women in uniform were largely over. As Hoffman left, a girl in a sober blue business suit, maybe the girl who opened the bathroom door, stood at a filing cabinet with her back to him. 
When she closed the drawer and turned, he could see she was several months pregnant. That was a priority job now. Not just replacing engine parts and weapon components, but replacing humans. Longer lead time, though. Ma'am, he said politely, touching a finger to his cap, and walked out into the square. It might have been his imagination, but the sky was less heavily clouded than usual. He looked up and saw nothing. Nothing was good news. His radio crackled. In his earpiece, Lieutenant Stroud's voice sounded a little more strained than usual. Sir, two more drone incursions. Delta are heading for Sovereign to RV with Echo Squad. Thanks, Lieutenant. Now go get some sleep. You're not the only control commander we've got. Tell Matheson to get his lazy ass in that seat. Yes, sir. Stroud out. The link went dead. Anya Stroud didn't fool Hoffman. Delta got extra rations from her, and it wasn't thanks to their refined taste in the arts. If she thought she could mend Marcus Phoenix and make a decent man out of him, then Hoffman had overestimated her intelligence, but it wasn't his place to lecture her on pinning after grossly unsuitable men. As long as she didn't let it interfere with her duties, it was her own private problem. And she wasn't her mother, poor kid. It must have been damned hard to grow up in the shadow of Helena Stroud, or Adam Phoenix, come to that. Hoffman brought himself to a halt, just short of actually feeling sorry for the man's son. You've still got a lot of ground to make up with me, Phoenix, Hoffman said aloud. He made his way down the road to headquarters, suddenly wanting to pick up a rifle on the way. He hadn't reacted that way in a long time. Now he felt naked with only his sidearm, even in the defended heart of the city. A lot. Sovereign Boulevard, Jacinto Dom could hear firing long before Delta reached the junction with the boulevard. Marcus broke into a faster run, then sprinted toward the sound. He's going to get us killed, Baird muttered, maintaining a steady jog. Asshole! Cole gave him a playful shove in the back, which was a hefty blow from a guy built like a brick shithouse. Baird almost fell. Come on, baby! Cole overtook him. He could still sprint like a pro. You don't want to get an ugly one. There was only ugly and uglier to choose from when it came to Locust. Dom switched comm circuits to pick up Echo's sergeant, Rossi, swearing a blue streak as he emptied his magazine. Delta, you took your frigging time. Marcus's voice cut in. Yeah, well, we're here now. Want a hand? We're two men down. What you think? We're holed up in the mall. Soon would be good. They said the world was divided into those folks who ran away from danger and those who ran toward it. It was funny how you could overcome that instinct to get the hell out if you were trained hard enough. Dom's legs were moving independently of his brain, and as he rounded the corner behind Cole, he saw what was giving Rossi's men problems. It was the biggest boomer he'd ever seen and a squad of its drone buddies. The boulevard was a big open space with precious little cover. Dom and the rest of Delta made their way up the road by darting from doorway to doorway, and laid up for a moment behind an overturned dumpster. The whole area south of the House of Sovereigns had once been full of manicured trees, expensive stores, and pavement cafes beyond Dom's pocket, but he'd window-shopped here with Maria before the kids were born. It was hard to tell that it had ever been a nice place, except for the shattered stone facades. All the white marble statues that stood in the wall niches had gone. Dom couldn't even see where the raised flower beds had been. 
the boomer and the accompanying drones were preoccupied with the entrance to the mall, another converted period building. Its weather doors were long gone, but a security shutter, a huge steel portcullis suspended between fluted columns, had been lowered. The boomer was rattling it as easily as a night watchman checking a flimsy door. The shutter was not going to last much longer. Marcus had his don't say anything, I'm calculating, face on. Rossi, he said, finger on his earpiece. Rossi, is the mezzanine floor above the entrance still intact? Rossi's voice was almost drowned out by gunfire. Yeah, all the way around the atrium. Heights about five meters. Have you got control of the shutter? Sphincters, no. Shutter, yes. Raise it on my mark. We've got grubs inside, too. I wasn't planning on letting reinforcements in. Just raise it when I say. Want to share? Let the boomer in and leave the rest to us. We'll go in from the top. Rossi went silent for a moment. Dom heard a voice in the background urging someone called David to hang in there. They had wounded to evacuate. Haven't got much choice, have we? Rossi said. Standing by. Keep your channel open. Marcus turned. Okay. We've got two exits at the rear of the mall, accessible from the loading bays. Up the fire escape, along the mezzanine, and then Dom and I drop the boomer from above. What do I do then? Catch up on my knitting? Baird said. And how do you know the layout? My mom used to go there a lot when I was a kid, Marcus said quietly. I explored. And that's what you're banking on? Your mom's shopping trips? Dom was certain that Marcus was going to punch Baird sooner or later. He'd never seen Marcus lose his temper, but nobody could take Baird's whining every day without wanting to kick the living shit out of him. The longer Marcus took it in silence, the bigger the eruption Dom expected. Yeah, Marcus sighed. So you and Cole give us covering fire if the grubs spot us moving. Once we're in and the shutter lifts, close up and go in behind them. Baird was still muttering over the comms channel about what a crap planet was while Dom followed Marcus back in the way they'd come and slipped down a side road to circle around a block. Just as Marcus had said, there was a rear entrance to the mall. The walls were still intact. The doors were missing. Dom checked his lancer and followed Marcus into what was obviously familiar territory to him. When you say, drop the boomer, Marcus, define drop. Jump him. Take his head off. Boomers were so big and powerful that they could carry small artillery pieces. They were also as dumb as planks, nowhere near as smart as drones, so one way to beat their sheer power was to outthink them and get close in so they couldn't use their weapons. As long as they don't rip your head off first. Marcus shot up the stairs two at a time, running on some childhood map that was obviously still vivid in his memory. Dom had spent much of his childhood with him, but he'd never been here. Maybe it hadn't been a happy place for him. Yeah, I thought that's what you meant, Dom said. Close quarters. He'll break our fall. Yes, Marcus meant jump too. What the hell am I going to do if he gets killed? Losing the kids had been bad enough, but when Maria went missing, Marcus had somehow held Dom together, whether he realized it or not. The guy was his friend, and his last link to happier times. He wasn't replaceable, not in a ravaged world like this. The only upside was that everyone, absolutely everyone, had lost family and friends. You didn't grieve alone. You were 
Understood. I'm not going to let him get killed. Marcus, oblivious to Dom's worries, kicked open a door at the top of the stairs. The two men stared into pitch blackness. Lights, Marcus said, sounding as if he was talking to himself. He always did, from the moment Dom first met him. The corridor had no natural light. Why can't they give us a damn flashlight? Okay, this passage runs past the management offices and opens onto the mezzanine by the elevator. What if they change the layout since you were last here? It's a protected historical building. They had to preserve the internal walls. It was the kind of obscure stuff Marcus was good at remembering. And it always came in handy. After fifty yards, feeling their way with their hands against the walls, they turned hard right. Dom could see a bright rectangle ahead. The corridor filled with the noise of an intense firefight. Doors onto the mezzanine, Marcus said. It was just an empty gap now, without even the hinges left intact. You okay? Fine. You think I've got a deaf wish? No. Well, maybe, sometimes. Hey, we do this together, okay? We always have, always will. Dom held up his fist, fingers extended. Okay, one, two, three. Dom was first through the doors this time, even though he didn't know the layout. The noise hit him like a brick wall. Once he was on the mezzanine, it all became clear. He could see the whole ground floor of the mall from here. From the carved drapes that flanked the interior entrance to the blackened shells of shops that lined the ground level, lit by sporadic muzzle flash. Rossi was crouched behind a retaining wall of stone by the stairs to the basement level, and the gear, David, was slumped on the ground near him surrounded by dark stains. Marcus sprinted to the far end of the floor, overlooking the entrance. Rossi, he said. Rossi, raise the shutter, now! Shit, can he reach the controls? Dom put one hand on the stone balustrade, preparing to vault over the edge. It was only five meters. Yeah, but it's onto the back of a frigging boomer. He was so pumped with adrenaline now, so set on sticking with Marcus no matter what happened, that everything he looked at was sharp, intensely colored, and somehow both slow motion and flashing past him. Can he reach them? That used to be the security desk, Marcus said. He had his rifle in his right hand. He leaned on his left hand and slid his left leg onto the edge. Gaze darting between the entrance and Rossi's position. He's right on top of the hand-operated controls. The shutter shook. It started to lift. Stand by, said Dom. I go first, and you cover me, okay? Okay. Boomers took a lot more stopping than drones. And if you don't take him out in one, I'm back up. The entrance was way close to Rossi's arc of fire. As Dom got ready to drop over the edge, it occurred to him that he could easily be caught in the crossfire. But by then, he was too pumped to stop. The shutter lifted high enough for the boomer to enter. It crouched under the barrier, almost squatting, then paused for a split second to look up. Marcus put a burst of fire through it. It didn't even slow the thing down. Boomers didn't seem to feel pain. Then he crashed down onto its back. This was a two-man job. Dom jumped too, boots first, and for a moment he wasn't sure if he'd hit Marcus or the boomer. But either way, it felt like slamming into concrete. The boomer went down, face first. The force of the impact winded Dom. He tasted blood in his mouth. As the boomer rose to its knees to shrug them off, Dom was aware of deafening fire over his head.
but nothing else. He caught a boomer in a chokehold, his arms closing around its squat neck, while Marcus emptied the clip into its gut. He fell back to reload. Dom jumped clear and carried on firing. Shit, those things really did take some stopping. Not even chainsaws did the job with them. Ordinary grubs, though, that was another matter. A drone came at them out of the rubble, just as the boomer sank to its knees, riddled with rounds. Dom turned to fire, but the grub jumped Marcus first. Shit! Dom couldn't get a clear shot as Marcus struggled with the grub. He revved off the chainsaw instead. Down through the shoulder, right through the main plumbing. Get off my body, you bastard! Marcus, hang on! But Marcus was already doing some carving of his own. His chainsaw screamed and stuttered against armor. There was a precise technique to the saw. You had to put your weight behind it, or else the blades skidded and didn't bite. The best action was a downward slice, leaning into the target, but Marcus was pinned on his back, cutting upward, and the grub was still thrashing around, even though it couldn't use its weapons close in. Dom sliced into its shoulder, and still the thing kept moving. But the boomer was out of the game now, just a shaking mound of meat on the floor. Somehow, Dom kept it in his peripheral vision as he sliced into the grub on top of Marcus. He was sure it was never going to die until it bellowed and threw back its head, hurling him clear. As Dom scrambled to his feet, he saw a spray of arterial blood, Marcus rolling clear, then everything ground to a sudden, silent halt. The boomer was down. It still wasn't dead. How could it hold out like that? But it would be very soon. The things bled out like any other creature. Any more? Marcus said, jumping up. Is that all of them? Baird? Cole? I'm mopping up, baby. Cole rose up from behind a shattered column and opened fire almost casually, aiming his lancer one-handed. Dom turned in time to see a drone falling backward a few meters away, still firing in an arc that tilted up to punch into the vaulted ceiling. Nice. Marcus wiped his chin and stared at his palm. Shit. Cole looked down at a dead grub with faint distaste and prodded one with his boot to check for movement. Then he inhaled. I hate that smell. He sounded muffled, but it was just Dom's ears recovering from the noise. It ain't putting me off my dinner, though. Are we done here? Marcus looked around. Everyone okay? Rossi, you still there? Yeah. Rossi stood up. He was spattered with blood, but it could have been anybody's, even the boomers. I've called for Kasevac. David's in a bad way. Abdominal wound. And I need to find Harry's rifle. It was a fact of life. Driven by shortages. They had to retrieve what kit they could. Rossi and the last gear left from Echo Squad carried David out into the open to wait for the King Raven and went back for Harry's body. Dom, caught in that weird limbo between fighting for his life and instant boredom, found he had to keep moving. He kept seeing shadows that just weren't there. It happened when he'd pushed himself too far on too little sleep. He could have sworn he saw someone go into the mall. I'll look for it, he said. Won't take long. Baird was rummaging through his pouches and pockets, fishing out ammo to reload. The chopper's going to be here in a minute. I said I'd look. Right, Rossi? Rossi had a tight grip on David's hand. It didn't look like the guy was in any shape to grip back. Thanks. Dom picked his way back through the mall, wondering what happened to that locust 
if there wasn't a pile of corpses to be set alight to prevent disease spreading. Sometimes, when he returned to a site, bodies were decomposing, and sometimes they were gone. Maybe the packs of feral dogs and cats scavenged them. It wasn't an appetizing thought. But he was sure the locusts didn't come back for their dead. They weren't like humans. They didn't pride themselves on leaving no grub behind. He took another look at the boomer. Shit! It wasn't dead. It still wasn't dead. Its eyes followed him as he moved around it, baleful and accusing. After all that, the thing was still hanging on, just like David. Dom aimed his lancer, then paused to flash Marcus on the radio. Ignore the firing, he said. Just finishing a job. He emptied his clip into the boomer. He wasn't sure if he was doing it to make sure it didn't get up again, like the manual said, or if he was doing the decent human thing and ending its misery. It might have been a waste of valuable ordnance, but at least it was dead now. He waited for its chest to stop moving, and then cast around looking for the Harry's lancer, ignoring the bodies. He'd been able to see some common ground with enemy troops in the Pendulum Wars, because they were soldiers just like him. But Locust, they were everything that was rotten in people, with none of the saving graces. There was nothing to pity, or love, or recognize. And they smelled bad. That smell clung to him until he showered it off, along with smoke and weapons residue. There was no sign of the Lancer. Another flicker in his peripheral vision made him turn, even though he knew it was just fatigue. There was a retail unit right ahead of him, its doorway partly blocked by the rubble. It was crazy, but he had to check. As Dom stepped through the opening, rifle raised, he thought he'd walked into a slaughterhouse. The debris on the floor from the collapsed ceiling was littered with bodies. In the smoky gloom, he could pick out limbs jutting from the debris, and the first thought was that a bunch of stranded had been living here when the place came under fire. For a second, he recoiled, thinking he'd stepped on a body, but the loud crack beneath his boots didn't sound like bone. It sounded like plastic. Now he could see the bodies were just old display mannequins, stripped of every reusable material. He picked up a stray forearm. Even the small metal ball joints at both ends were missing. He felt stupid, but he knew he wasn't the first guy to make the same mistake in the heat of the moment. Dom could now hear the staccato sound of an incoming raven. He picked his way back toward the exit, squinting against the daylight from the mall that plunged the rest of the space back into relative darkness. His gut rumbled, and he reached in his belt pouch for some dry rations to tide him over. It was then that he looked up, the edge of the foil packet still clamped between his teeth as he started to rip it open, and found himself staring across the beam of a rifle's tactical lamp. He aimed before he'd consciously worked out what was happening. He fired. 